Well, hey, let me ask a question, because today we're going to be focused on parenting. And like I said earlier, in this sermon series, we're talking about relationship goals. Like when you're on Instagram, when you're on TikTok, when you're on Facebook, when you're on Snapchat, whatever is the flavor of the month of social media, and you see someone having a great time with their spouse or their boyfriend or their fiance or their girlfriend, and they tag hashtag relationship goals or someone comments on it like, I want a marriage like that. I want a boyfriend like that. I want to go and have a relationship like that. Hashtag relationship goals. Our hope is through this series that we're going through is that you get to pick up the tools and information to be able to apply it to your life, to be able to have those moments where you're like, there we go, hashtag relationship goals. Other people get to look to you and say those same kinds of comments. And so today, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything crazy, but I'm going to ask a question really quickly. And if this is you, raise your hands. How many dads do we have in the room today? Raise your hand if you're a dad. All right, moms, wives, everybody else, give those dads a round of applause. Here's the thing. Statistically, you're the minority in the church. And so we're so proud that there's so many dads here today engaging in the church service. And my hat is off to you if I had one on my head, saying thank you for being brave and showing up. Maybe you're here because you wanted to be here, and maybe you're here because someone dragged you out to be here. Regardless, I'm thrilled that you're here, and I want you to know we've been praying for you and your family specifically for this series. Now, I remember when I first became a dad. I'm a dad of three little boys. They're all in a row. We got a second grader, first grader, and kindergarten. And we actually have my neighbors here today, and they, could, they can admit, it is wild at my house. You hear lots of screaming and laughing and kids playing around in the yard and getting, hey, get out of the street. It's crazy at my house. But I remember what it was like when I was just a guy married to a gal, and she was pregnant, and you know we were pretending like we had everything figured out, not knowing what the next phase would look like. And what comes with a baby? Baby showers, right? And so baby showers, unfortunately, men, most of the time we get out of like the wedding shower kind of situation. But when you got baby showers, we get dragged along for that experience. And so the dads at the baby showers usually like smile and shake hands. And then like we kind of huddle off to the side and actually ask ourselves, what on earth is going on in our lives? Like what is about to happen? And we always have one dad that's been down the road ahead of us when we were in this season. So again, when I was having my firstborn, I just happened to be in a friendship group that had a bunch of different families that were having their firstborns. And there was only like one or two that had been down the road before us. And so there was a big question that all the men were asking each other off to the side, away from the women. And do you know what that question was? Are you going to look? And then immediately it was, don't do it. Don't. Now, Women, if you heard the stories that the men share at those baby showers off to the side, we'd be in the doghouse for the rest of our lives. We would never get out of the doghouse. And so with that said, let me share my story with you. (laughs) So here we go. Stephanie's pregnant. She's going into labor. We're heading to the hospital. She doesn't know I'm doing this. She's going to kill me. We're heading to the hospital. We're hustling there. My in-laws live within driving distance. So they're in the car and they're moving and they're driving to the hospital as well. They're seeing that Stephanie's pretty far along, and this baby Judah, he's on his way into this world, and so everyone's excited, you know, and mom's getting in the room, they give her the epidural, and then mom, I mean, Stephanie's such a straight-laced person, seeing her with an epidural was hilarious in her life, and then they roll her into the other room, and they're preparing us for the situation. You know, I'm dad, so of course I'm going to be in the room when my firstborn is born. And so I purposely stand with all the information that the other men have tipped me off on over on the other side of the bed, right? On this side. And then that my mother-in-law comes in the room. Now, I love my mother-in-law. We're like best friends together. But I mean, this is a little awkward of a situation to have your mother-in-law in the room with you, right? I mean, eh. And then the doctor, so both my mother-in-law, you know, we're respectful. My mother-in-law's conservative too, so she, she stands over on the head side of the bed. And so we're over on this side of the bed, and then the doctor turns up the awkwardness meter a whole bunch, and he says, hey, mom, dad, grab a leg and pull while we do this. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is that's too much information for me to even handle. So anyways, baby Judah came into the world, and immediately I fell in love with my son. 
And I have fallen in love with each and every son the moment, obviously I loved them before when they were in the womb, but it's a different experience when you get to hold them and see their smile and look into their eyes and you realize, I'm in trouble. I don't know what I'm doing holding this baby. And you're like, thank God we're in the hospital for a few more days. I'm going to soak this up. And I remember the day that they discharged Stephanie and Judah. I almost said I. I wasn't admitted to the hospital that, though. They discharged Stephanie and Judah. They, we, they nurse and they make sure they get you to the car because they want to make sure you put that baby in the car seat well. They make sure mom gets in the car and buckles her belt. They don't care about dad. Dad, you can figure it out on your own. I turn on the car and I drive away from the hospital and I'm a little like, could you believe the nerve of that nurse? She just like turned around and walked away from us. She's not coming with us to help us in this like parenting. And I remember thinking, I've got to like take care of this baby now. And I have a a wife that's just gone through a physical traumatic experience that I have to take care of now. Like I am not prepared or equipped or I have no idea what I am doing. And so young dads that are in the room that still have like babies and diapers or maybe you're just early on in the toddler phase and you think you finally figured it out, I hate to break the news to you, it changes. Those little boogers grow up and then you feel like you're not equipped all over again. You're like, what on earth is this kid doing? Because children live in phases, and they go through phases quick. And right when you think you've mastered the art of parenting, they change and they enter into a new phase of life. So I've been a dad for eight years now, but I spoke to a whole bunch of dads in our church to get information for today's message, because we have dads of all generations, empty nesting dads, great granddads in the church, young dads, middle-aged dads, we got them all in this church. And so I talked to a lot of them to get a lot of intel to see where we're at and get tidbits of information. And one thing that I have learned over the last eight years of being a dad is this, and it's the first fill in the blank in your outline if you're following along, which looks like this little guy. Here's the big idea for today's message. This is what I've learned over the last eight years. Our children learn more from what we do than what we say. Our children learn more from what we do than what we say. That means more is caught than taught. Like your kids are watching you, and they are a sponge. And what you do, eventually they will pick up on and do. Now, my, again, I said my in-laws are a little bit more conservative. And, you know, there's the words that I say that I don't think are bad words that say in front of my in-laws that turn into bad words. Like, oh, I didn't know that was a no-no word. <laughs> And so, you know, there's that kind, of that kind of environment a little bit. And so I can slip and say a thing or two, say a phrase that you wouldn't want your kid to say around other people. And what happens? It's almost like my kids are planning to embarrass me because the moment that they repeat something that you said is around the, right, the wrong people. Right? It's not about the people that would like brush it off. It's always the ones that you're going to feel embarrassed of. And I remember the first time when my kids said something that I said to them or said around them in front of my in-laws. You could have painted my wife purple. She was so embarrassed when they said that to her. And so what I'm trying to tell you is more is taught or more is caught than taught. Like, because I said, hey, never say that again. I said that, but you know, don't repeat what daddy says. What did they do? They repeated what dad said, and Stephanie gave me the eyes, the eyes of daggers in that moment where she knew this kid is repeating things that I'm saying. So I've had to really kind of learn this the hard way, where I've got a model as dad, the way to live, because my kids are going to follow my example, and they're going to follow my wife's example. There's this scripture in Proverbs chapter 20 that kind of gives this thought and this idea to us. Proverbs 20 verse 7, and here's what it says. The right, the right living act with integrity. The children who follow their example are happy. What this verse is teaching us is that the way that we live will rub off on our kids more often than not. Now this is Proverbs. Okay. I think my jacket is unhappy with my microphone, so I'm going to take it off for a moment here. Um, this verse is saying it's wisdom. The book of Proverbs is wisdom. Maybe it's not this. I don't know. We'll just roll with it. Okay, the book of Proverbs is wisdom, right? And the idea of Proverbs is more often than not, more often than not, if you do this, it will turn out your way. But results can vary with kids, right? 
But what this verse is teaching us, if you live with honor and integrity, more often than not, your kids will catch on to that. More often than not, your kids will see your example and they'll start following what you are doing. Now again, this verse is not a guarantee because Proverbs isn't a cause and effect book. It's not like I promise you if you do this, you get this result. But it is a book of wisdom where it says basically more often than not, here is the type of example you could live and here's the chances you're setting your kid up for success. But like I said, sometimes we have a kid and you've done all the right things or maybe you've seen someone do all the right things and still the kid turns out differently than what you've hoped for or what they hoped for. And there's a level of this that I just need to reassure you in the room. At some point, at some place, as a parent, it's up to them. You've set them up for success. You've done all you could do. And at some point, it's their choice if they're going to follow through on it. And so if you're one of those kids, or even if you're an adult and you still point back to mommy and dad, and you're like, they messed me up, that might be true. But at some point, at some time, you made a decision. You made a decision to live a certain life way. And it's not all on your mom and dad. I'll get into that in a personal example later on in the sermon. And so I've learned from this version, verse, verse, and talking to people in our church and researching this subject, we're going to go through what I call an acrostic today. Think about like a word where each letter stands for something. And the word we're going to spell out today is the word model. Model. How do we model living with integrity and honor for our kids. And so the first letter in your outline there in the word model is M, which stands for management of time in life. Important areas to model to our kids is the management of our time and our life. Now, how many parents are in here? Now they're going to be scared to raise their hands that I say this. You don't have to raise your hand. But if you're a parent of a little and your kid's not in school yet, Enjoy the time that you have with your spouse. The time will go away. You will not own your schedule anymore. And if you have more than one kid, good luck. And it even gets more complicated when they're different genders because they're doing complete different things at times. Okay, look at my life or look at lives of people about my age of my age of kids. We get up at 6 a.m. in the morning, Monday through Friday, and we send the kids out the door at 6.30 to get to the bus stop. 6 30 in the morning is my first task that I have to hit with my kid to be able to deliver them to school on time, right? Which means I got to back that clock up to getting them dressed and fed and make sure they have their mask on and their backpack on and all kinds of stuff and get them out the door or the bus won't accept them, right? And so I got to make sure they got clothes and shoes. And this weird thing, if they don't have pants on, they can't go to school. I don't know. So I got to make sure they put their pants on before they go out the door. And you think it's a joke, but I got littles and sometimes they're just not paying attention and they'll go out there and they're skippies and it's cold, (laughs) And I'm not awake. I'll drink coffee, and I'm like, what? What? You didn't have pants on? Get back in here and get some pants on. Anyways, your time is not yours because before you know it, they're off at school, and then at 2.30, what happens? You've got to pick them up from school, and so you're picking them up. And then you're heading to sports practice so they can go and practice a sport, and hopefully all the kids, if you have more than one, are going to the same team or the same sport, but chances are they're going different directions. And so you're probably tapping friends, spouses, extended family members to help you get the kids to the right places. And then what happens is sports practices are over, your kids are hot, they're stinky, they're smelly, they're like sweaty, they're getting back into your car, you got the air blowing so you don't have to smell them anymore, and you're driving home and your mind is immediately racing because you're thinking, I've got to feed these kids, what can I feed them? Should I go through the drive-thru? Be like, no, we did that yesterday, if we keep doing that, they're going to die of a heart attack, I can't give them chicken nuggets and burgers every day, we got to get them food. And so you're driving home and you're trying to prepare in your mind, what are we going to cook for dinner? You get home and you realize, we can't cook dinner, we got to get them into the showers, into the tubs, they stink too much. And so you get them bathed and you get them down to the kitchen, you're like, I still need to cook dinner. And you're throwing mac and cheese out on the table. You're feeding them, and then you're telling them, okay, time to get your jammies on. Well, probably got it on after the bath. Now it's time to go upstairs and go to bed. Wait, nope, nope, back down the stairs. we got to do homework, or you're going to fail your school. we got to get the homework out. Do all that homework. Okay, now you did your homework. Now get back up and go to bed. And then what happens? You repeat it all again tomorrow. And if that's not busy enough, there's other things we have to take care of, like someone's got to do the laundry. Someone's got to clean the house. 
Someone's got to do the yard work. And if there wasn't a logistical nightmare of that, you've got to plan in the future. Like my son Judah's growing through a growth spurt and his pants are like this when he's walking around the house. And I'm like, what you do? You're supposed to wait till Christmas for grandma to buy you clothing. <laughs> what are you thinking growing up like that? Come on. Dad's only got so many dollars. <laughs> and so we got to plan out like, okay, now somewhere in the mix, I got to go shopping for my kids and get my kids to the department store to try some clothing on and see if it fits them. And then you have all your extracurricular things, right? Like father-daughter dances this week. How many of you took your daughters to dances? I saw many Facebook photos over the last few weeks of that. You have your Mardi Gras parades that some of you are taking kids to. You have, uh, what is it? There's a, there was a father-daughter dance. Well, whatever. You know there's extra stuff going on outside of the school that you could be going to that you have to take a kid to. And again, that's if all your kids are the same age and gender. You kind of do the same thing. But if they become different genders, well, if they were born different genders... Sorry. I'm from California. Sometimes things slip out wrong, okay? So sometimes you got a boy and a girl, and they're just kind of into different things, like pageants. That's what I was trying to think of, the pageants. So you're into a pageant, and like your boys aren't into pageants, but the girls are into the pageants, and so you're going to two different directions on that. And if the parenting wasn't busy enough, what happens else is that you've got a marriage. You're supposed to take care of this marriage. And so now you have a marriage you got to worry about. And so you're supposed to be investing with your spouse. So after you get those kids to bed at night, after you do the laundry, after you clean the house up, you're supposed to make time for your spouse and smile and be enjoying them and trying to make them feel loved. And you are tired. Your gas tank is empty. Empty. Now, here's the thing that we all need to know. Sometimes what you got involved in your kid's life, they're good things. And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but sometimes you need to take a step back and say, are we maxing our family out because we're involved in too many things? Your kid will survive. Let me tell you what's more important than your schedule, because we can get caught up in trying to pull everything off. And guess what? We become, we make parenting all about the task, all about the task and jumping through all the hoops and trying to keep it all together. But what your kid needs more than a taskmaster than someone who's a logistical genius, your kid needs a mom. Your kid needs a dad. Parenting is more about the relationship than it ever is about the task. Your child needs the relationship that you and only you can provide as mom and as dad. And we intuitively know this, right? Like you intuitively realize this because when your kids are all growing up and they're out of the house, what do we have left? Do we have tasks left or the relationship? No, you don't have the task anymore. You have the relationship left. And so you in this season, I'm encouraging you with your time, make time management well. Think about your schedule. See if there's something that you should be shaving off your family schedule so that way you can pour into and invest into your kids. Because God's given you, you a unique voice that no one else has on earth to be able to penetrate right to the heart of your child, to right to their soul. And your child needs to hear wisdom and teaching and love from you that they can't get from anyone else. And so as your mom, as their mommy, as their daddy, I'm encouraging you, don't get lost in the tasks and the time schedule. Make time for the relationship. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But as a church... We believe that there's two big things in the family that matter. First of all, we believe that family matters. Can you say family matters? All right. And then we believe marriage matters. Can you say marriage matters? Now, here's what our church is doing. We are leaning all in on the local family. Don't get me wrong. This is a multi-generational church. We are going to have groups and studies and places for all generations in our church, from babies all the way to 90-year-old people, right? Everybody gets a spot inside Wilson Avenue. But we realize that the family in our country and in our culture is under attack. And we want to provide protection, safety, and tools for the family. And so as a church, we're going all in on the family to try to protect the family. Because here's the deal, regardless of who you think's behind it, I'm not trying to get into politics, the enemy of your soul wants to break you up as a couple. 
He wants to destroy your marriage. And if he destroys your marriage, guess what he gets to do? He gets to destroy your family because now the kids are coming and going from multiple houses. And if he could destroy your family, maybe he could destroy your thought about God. And if he could destroy your thought about God, he could take hope right out of your life. I'm not saying you're, not, you're losing salvation or anything because we're Baptists. You're secure. But you might feel like it. You might feel like it. And so then you're like, oh, no, God. Like, why, how could God exist if he broke my marriage up, he let my marriage break up, he let my family break up, and you lose all hope. And what does the enemy do? He tricks you into some kind of self-medicating, some kind of coping mechanism that ultimately, possibly, will end everything good in your life. I've seen the story multiple times because I am a former recovery pastor. I've been through the 12-step program. I know what it's like to go through recovery. I know what it's like to see a chain of events, and I've been down that road myself. And so as a church community, we're not going to stand for it anymore. And so since you're all Alabama football fans, right? So some Auburn people just puked a little bit in their mouth. Don't worry, they're a minority church. We're, we're praying for them to get saved, okay? All right, since you guys are all football nuts in the house, we've called it offense and defense, okay? This is as far as in sports as I get. I was raised by a single mom. We never did sports, but this is a sports nut as I can get, like skimming the surface here. So we're going to provide offense for the family and defense for the family. So really quickly, I want to tell you about the offense that we're going to provide for you and give you tools to do to be able to help your family survive and thrive in this season. First, we're going to make sure that we have kids' church each and every Sunday. And our kids' church is not going to be boring. It's going to be the best hour of your kids' week. It's not uncommon for a guest to come back two, three, four times, and they tell me, you know what, Chris, like, you know, the church is good and all. We were going to keep church shopping, but my kids keep begging, keep demanding that I come back to church here at Wilson Avenue, and I'm like, praise Jesus. You know why? Because as much as we're trying to make this a great experience for you, we definitely 100% want your children to feel the love and hope and joy that only Jesus can provide. And so we're teaching this information to them about Jesus at an age-appropriate level, and we want them experiencing the goodness of Jesus so much that they are begging to come back and get some more of that Jesus again next weekend. And so we're always going to make sure your kids are having a blast, and we're going to teach them about the gospel, and we're going to make it the best hour of their week. That's our goal. That's our marker for you. The second thing we're going to do, we're going to make sure we always have relevant sermons in here for you. If you can't use it on Monday, I won't say it on Sunday. Here's what it means. If you can't start applying it to your life the moment you gain that information from us, I'm not going to talk about it. I could use big theological words. I have a master's in divinity. I have a doctorate in ministry. I could use these big words and confuse you. We could get into the, the, like, the nitty-gritty. Does the communion juice, when you take communion, does it actually turn into the blood of Jesus Christ when we drink it, or is it just representing the blood of Jesus Christ? And we could geek out over the theological lessons and the disagreements. Of them. But what good is that? What matters most is that you're using that moment to let your spirit connect to the Holy Spirit, right? To remember what Jesus did on the cross is far more important than what, that theological debate. And so what I'm trying to say to you is we're not going to get caught up in some random thing. We're going to get caught up in teaching you the truth and the gospel of Jesus so you can live it in your life in relevant, applicable things for your life. And don't get me wrong, because sometimes people are like, Pastor Chris, you're just not deep enough in your preaching for me. You know what that means? That means you're not confusing me on Sunday morning, so you must not be doing your job. Uh-uh, uh-uh. My job is to take something that's really big and theological and make it super palatable for you to, to take, remember, and apply to your life. And so we're going to keep doing relevant sermons here like relationship goals. How do we have better relationships? Well, if you lose a family, your life doesn't matter how theological I go, your family's broken, right? So let's talk about what the Bible says about us and relationships and parenting and all kinds of stuff like that. Relevant sermons. Here's the next thing we're going to do. We're going to keep providing Awana. Awana is our midweek children's discipleship program. We've had 91 kids come through our Awana program this semester. Now, Awana is for three-year-olds through junior hires. And they come and they play all kinds of fun games in our gymnasium. We have some of the best leaders in that room pouring into your kids. I don't know how they have so much fun there, but my kids on Wednesday morning, when they realize it's Wednesday Awana Day, they start doing the happy dance when they're getting ready for the day because they're excited about going to Awana later that night. I'm like, kids, you know this is about like memorizing Bible verses and hearing Bible stories. Like, <laughs> you're, you're dancing like we're going to Disneyland tonight. Like, what's going on? I don't know. You just got some amazing leaders that are gifted and love to have fun with your kids. And because of the WANA program, my child, who's the youngest, all three of my kids have said 
the Lord's Prayer and have accepted Jesus into their heart and soul. My youngest, Levi, this week came up to my wife and asked her, hey, how do you accept Jesus into your heart? I'm like, okay, that's a softball pitch right there, like a slow, soft, underhanded pitch for a home run. I'm like, he didn't ask, like, what happens when you die. He didn't ask, like, he was prepared to ask the most important question of his life. And the kid's in kindergarten, and he asked that. And so my wife and him had the prayer time, and he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. You know how that happened? It happened from the one-two punch of Wilson Avenue. He comes on the weekend, and he gets the truth that Jesus preached to him, and he has fun, and he, has, he realizes that Jesus is a lot of fun, and I want to spend eternity with him. He comes to Awana, and he memorizes the truth of God and the Bible verses, and he's prepared for the lies that the world say because now he's ready. He's ready with the truth of the gospel of Jesus. Okay, i got to go faster. We're going to be here all day on the list. And that's not, that's not because he's the preacher's kid. That's because we've got amazing leaders in the programs that want to teach this truth to your children. We're going to continue to double down on the family and the curriculum for your kids. We're launching a thing called Parent Q in our church. You can go to the app store today and download the app Parent Q. It's from the people who provide our curriculum, and it hooks right in. So you can have discussion questions midweek off what your children learn on Sunday. They can watch videos and play games, and they have conversation starters for you to be able to go deeper with your kids. And it's not something that you have to study up on so you can go deep with them. It just helps them reinforce what they learned on the weekend. And so right now, you could download the app Parent Q from the App Store. You don't have to do it at this moment, but we now partner with that, and we make sure Sunday is in sync with our Parent Q app. Cool thing about Parent Q, it tells you how long your kid's going to be in your home. Now, it's not like a countdown clock to like, get out the door, <laughs> you're 18. It's more of like, hey, your kid is continuously going through phases. You need to be aware of the phases that your kid's going through. And you only have so much time with your kid that you get to invest in them. It's actually 936 weeks. And I opened it up, and for every kid, it makes a profile on the app. And I have 543 weeks left with Judah. Time's going fast. He's only eight years old. The weeks are going by quick. And I realize time is of the essence to build these lasting memories, to pour into him, to make the most of the time that we have together. We're going to continue to provide our teen programs right now. If you have a middle schooler and they're checked into our middle school program, they're upstairs getting the, they have their church service. They have message up there. They have discipleship groups, all kinds of fun stuff like that. Wednesday night, we have our high school program right here in the same room upstairs in our teen center, and they get their own church service with discipleship groups and sermons and conversations. So we want to create a place for our teens. Let's go to the next one. We're going to give you a resource called Phases. I keep saying this intentionally. Your kids are constantly going through a phase, one phase to the next, and we want to prepare you for this. So just like your kids go up in a grade each and every year in the school system, right? Your kids move up. If they pass, your kids move up and go to the next grade. So if they're kinder, they go to first, first to second. And they do that in our church too around August. And so every August, we're going to give you one of these pamphlets. Let's see if it pops up. And this pamphlet's great because it teaches you to how to understand what your kid's going through this year, to understand the way that a, a kid's mind is wired in this season. Like some ages, they take everything literal. And so you have to be very careful what you say. It's going to give you prompting questions on how you like should be talking to your kid about God and how you have follow-up conversations. Now, this is a really cool packet, and we want to invest in your family. And so this costs the church a lot of money. So once a, once a year, we're investing in you, and we're giving you the next age when your kid moves up in a grade or up in the age all the way through high school. Now, we, this is new for us. And we're halfway through the year. So here's what I want to do for you guys. I want to set you up for success. Come back next Sunday if you're a parent. Check your kid into the kids program. And when you check your kid into the kids program, we're going to give you the, the pamphlet that goes with your child's age group next week and next week only. Because we're investing. We pulled out of savings to do this. And we want to invest in your family. And so next week we'll do that. And then if you miss next week, you've got to wait till August. And we'll have the next round of those pamphlets in August. And so we are on the offense. We want to equip you because the goal of offense is what? Set you up for success before anything bad has happened. Get your family humming on all levels. Like get it going well. And then we're going to do some defense here because life is not perfect and we face challenges and things get broken. And so first we're going to start offering parenting workshops in the fall. 
And we're going to have workshops like, hey, you're a first-time parent? Come hear what it's like to be a Christ follower and a parent. You're going to, kids going into elementary school, we're going to do a workshop for that for you. Kids going into junior high, we're going to do a workshop for you on that. Kids going into high school, we're going to do a workshop for that. You're now going to be an empty nester and your parent, kids are going off to college. We're going to start doing workshops for all of those phases for you because we want to equip the family for the best possible opportunity to keep following Jesus and set you up for success because the family matters. The family matters, right? The family matters. The next thing we're going to offer is a program called Reengage. Reengage. It actually launches next month. It's our marriage enrichment program. This is for all types of marriages, good marriages, marriages that are like, eh, and then broken marriages, like we're heading to divorce or we already are divorced. Here's the thing that it takes. You've got to go with your spouse. So it can't be like you as a single adult coming to reengage. It takes two to tango, right? And so this is a marriage enrichment program, and it helps all different types of marriages. I've seen people who thought they were, like, if you're just going to say, hey, where were you from a 1 to 10 on a, on a scale of goodness? You're like, well, we thought we were an 8, but when we went through reengage, we realized we were more like a 4 or a 5. But now we're actually an 8 at the end of the semester because we've learned how to better equip each other to communicate and forgive and work together as a couple. I've seen people who were divorced go through the program together on this marriage enrichment and come back at the end of the, ser- at the, end of the season and we just throw a wedding for them and they get married all over again. We've seen many people recommit their vows through the re-engage program. So we're bringing that here now to, to Wilson Avenue. I did it at my last church. So we're bringing it here to Wilson Avenue. We want to equip you. So if you're interested in something like that, on your connection card, there's a box called Reengage. Check the box. I'm going to send out all the information this coming week for that. The next thing we're going to launch here is a program called Regeneration. That's our 12-step Christ-following program. So if you need recovery for a hurt, habit, or hang-up, like there's something, some vice in your life, some kind of hang-up that's going on in your life that's taking you from who God created you to be, we want you to break free of that. Because if mom and dad are needing recovery. It's affecting the whole family, okay? I've been through recovery. I know this, and I want to set you up for success. And so we're going to have some defense here. And the last thing that I want to point out is we're going to boot up our campground, and we're going to play defense, and we're going to get your kids saved, right? We're going to have kids camp and teen camp. Who cares about VBS? We're going to go to our 80-acre campground. We're going to go do kids camp, right? We're going to go to the next level. We're going to make sure we have camps for teen. If it's not a bullet point, just write it in your mind that it should be there on the screen. Um, and we're going to boot that up, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and we're going to reach your children for Jesus, and we're going to let them know that God loves them so much. And so we are leaning in, and we're doing all this because the family matters. Now, I know what you're saying. You're like, Chris, that is a whole lot. I'm a little overwhelmed that you're expecting me to go through all of this stuff right after you just told me how busy my life is. Don't worry, we're going to walk with you through that season. And that's not like you have to do each and everything on here. We're giving you all the tools. You pick up the tool that you want to use in your family for that season that you think is appropriate for your family. So again, we need to manage the time of our family's lives because it matters. We want to pour into the relationship that we have with our kids. So let's read Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. There you go. So be careful how you live. Be mindful of your steps. Don't run around like idiots as the rest of the world does. Instead, walk as the wise. Make the most of every living and breathing moment because these are evil times. The next letter and model is O. Don't worry, we're going to go faster here. The next letter and model is O. Observe teachable moments. Observe teachable moments. There are moments in your child's life that we are to speak into. Again, you have a voice that only you were gifted by God to be able to speak right to the core of your child. We'll do our best as a community to wrap arms around you and to come around and help you succeed, but your voice matters more than anyone else's voice that your child will hear. And so you can't subcontract this out. You have to be able to do this too. And so that's why we're doing everything we talked about to help equip you and help get you there. And so observe teachable moments. And there's three areas I want to challenge you as parents to pay attention to. Emotions, spiritual, and relational. Emotionally, spiritually, relationally. Those are the key areas you need to pay attention and look for moments to teach them things. Look for areas to say, ah, this is a good opportunity for me to sit down and have a conversation with them. We're going to read out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is actually from Moses, and it's been used for um, centuries now to help people parent well. Here's what it says. 
I'm going to read it off my notes. Here's what it says. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, and when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. What Moses is teaching us here is like, hey, mom and dad, it's got to be in you before it can be in them. Your kids have to catch it from you. They have to be watching you. Remember we talked about living with honor and integrity? Your kids have to see you doing it. And if they see you doing it, then they can start grabbing onto it and doing it themselves. And so Moses is teaching us, hey, you know what? You should be doing this all the time, like when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up and when you're at home. So the way that my family has kind of applied this verse to our lives is like when we're at home, sometimes, because we have a, like an open floor plan, we have a TV on a swivel stand. Sometimes I put the TV aside and you turn off Netflix and mom and dad put their phones in the kitchen and we sit down at the dinner table and we eat dinner together as a family. I know it's a novel idea. It's so old school, but do you know what it lets us do? It lets us ask our kids, hey, what's the highlights of the day? What's the lows of your day? And then we get to hear them talk about what they went through at school or at church or with their friends, and we get to teach teachable moments. Like, ah, I see a relationship opportunity to sp- speak into. I see an emotional opportunity that they're struggling with their emotions that we could speak into. I see a spiritual opportunity that they're struggling with God in this topic, and I get to lean into it and talk to them. Now, Moses says, do it at home. Do it on the road. Man, it's like Moses knew we'd have cars one day. It's crazy. <laughs> Okay, and so what the greatest part about talking to your kids in the car is what? They're a captive audience. They are strapped in and tied down. They can't get out of the car. So you get an opportunity to talk to your kids about life in the car. You're going to be hustling to and go for all the logistics you're doing anyways. You might as well get some parenting time, some relational time out of them. And then the last thing he said there was bedtime and morning time, which are rhythms of life. There's special moments of life that your kid's going to have every time. And so why don't you make it something where you show them, this is how we close out our day with Jesus, and this is how we start our day with Jesus, just to help ground them with Jesus. Not ground them in trouble, but ground them like, you know, make things healthy and smooth. We're helping you lean into your faith. Because, you know, when I read this verse, I'm not an academic type. I know I have those degrees and whatnot. I'm not an academic type. My wife is actually. I was more of the C student, like I'm all about C's because C's get degrees, baby, right? C's are good enough, get her done, right? My wife is like the honor student, and so that kills her inside him when I say stuff like that. But I'm far more concerned with my kids' emotional intelligence than I ever am their intellectual intelligence. Their EQ, so much more important than their IQ to me. Don't don't get me wrong, I don't want dummies, but... What matters most is that they're learning how to control their emotions, that when they're hot, when they're upset, when they're bothered, they're not making decisions from that place. They're letting those emotions simmer on down, and then they're able to make the call from a good spot, from a rational spot in their mind. So I want to teach them how to be emotionally intelligent, and this is a great way for us to do that. The next letter and model is D, which stands for date your family, date your family. Date your family. Now, when I say this, seize the opportunity to make memories with your family. I get it. There's so much to do in life. But look for opportunities to date your family. Some of you guys did that this week. I saw the father-daughter dances. That's dating your family, creating memories with your kids. This week we went and saw down in the government plaza, like at one o'clock on Friday, they had the George Washington band from the army. And, you know, it was like the old times. And it was cool to see them. My kids were like, why are we here? I'm like, because we're trying to make memories. Just watch the band. (laughs) Okay? I don't know. (laughs) But I walked through the freezing cold wind to get here for you, so you're going to enjoy this. (laughs) They'll remember, we saw a George Washington type band with dad in the cold wind one day. Look for opportunities to build memories with your kids. Look for opportunities to take them on trips. Look for opportunities to date your family. I mean, yes, date your spouse. That's a good thing. You need to build that into the schedule. But sometimes pick your kids up early from school and take them to Dairy Queen and have ice cream and just celebrate them. Just look for ways to love 
your kids and make lasting memories. You don't have to go on crazy trips. You don't have to go to Disney World. You could, but you could just take them on the boat down the creek and go catch some catfish. Make memories with your family. Look for ways to invest time together. It could be as simple as just putting a rug on the floor, putting Disney Plus on the TV. Everyone gets a bowl of popcorn, and this is movie night in our family. We sit and hug and watch movies together. Date your family. Now, I have been guilty of breaking this rule from time to time in my life, and I remember sitting in your seat, and a pastor was talking about this exact thing. He called it choosing to cheat, choosing to cheat, and I was cheating my family. You see, I was working overtime each and every week, and again, I don't have anything against overtime once in a while, but if it's too repetitive all the time, you're cheating your family. You are. Now, hear me out on this. I was choosing to work extra hours each day at work, and I'd come home just a little bit later because at the end of the week, I could see more product. I had more paperwork completed. I had more projects completed. My boss was happy. The company was happy. My job's more secure because we can't get rid of Chris. Look how much performance we get out of him. Things are good. And at the end of the week, I could point to all of my accomplishments. And when I would go home and not work overtime, I really had nothing to show of it. Like, what good did it do? I don't have anything to point to at the end of the week. And I remember the pastor teaching this lesson, and he said, think about you doing this two years ago. Think about you doing this two years ago. What did you do? Does your company care anymore about those overtime hours you worked two years ago? Does anyone remember what you did? The same is true here. Think about your company 10 years ago. Someone worked their brains out for your company. Same is true for me. I could think about this church 50, 60 years ago. This church is 80 years old. What happened 60 years ago? I'm sure someone was working hard. I'm sure someone was burning the midnight oil, prepping for services, pouring into relationships, going the extra mile, sacrificing time with their family. Does anyone remember it? No. And it's not that I'm saying we shouldn't work overtime at, at times, but if you pour into your family and you make sure to protect your home life, Well, my mic is just unhappy today. Okay, if you pour into your family and you make sure to protect your family and protect the time that you have with your family, you might not see the results this week. You might not see the results this month. But what happens in two years? You went from here with your kids and your wife and your spouse to here, right? A little bit more integrity, a little bit more love. They're going to trust you more. You deepen the relationship. They're going to be that much more loyal to you. And over time, you choosing to pour into your kids When they grow up, you're going to have a whole different relationship, and you're going to be able to measure it the long term. And when you're on your deathbed, not that I'm saying anyone should be on a deathbed, but one day when you're on your deathbed, who do you want around your bed? Do you want all the projects? Like, hey, bring in all those projects I gave my life to, and let me stare at it. No. You want the loved ones around your bed. And it's not so they can mourn poor you that's dying, so you could celebrate all the beautiful times you had together and thank Jesus for putting you guys together in your life. That's what we want. And so we've got to date our family, and we've got to stop cheating our family of the time, which goes back to our first point. Let's go to the next letter here, which is E, encourage your kids. Like I said earlier, your voice is unique, and you could speak, and you're, you're, <clears throat> your voice is unique, and when you speak it, it cuts right to their heart and soul differently than it does anyone else. You're their mama and daddy. And what you got to say is different than anyone else saying it. Now, maybe you grew up in here, like I know there are some like great people, great people. Like I wish I had, I wish I had like brother JB as a daddy. I wish I had brother Mike as a dad. I wish I had Miss Cindy as a mommy. You know, I wish I had some of you because you guys were just amazing parents. And I don't have to worry and wonder if Stacy and Jared and Jennifer ever heard, I love you or I'm proud of you. And so if you had great moms and dads that told you, I love you and I'm proud of you, that's wonderful. But those are some of the more important things you could ever say to your kids. And you might brush it off because you heard it all your life. You're like, Chris, that's important. Like making sure you feed your kids important and making sure you clothe your kids important. Uh Uh-uh. Way more important. Anyone can feed your kid. Anyone can make sure your kid has clothing on. Not anyone can just love your kid. If you're not going to do it, who will? strangers are not going to stop their life to pour into your kids to tell them long term, I love you, I'm proud of you. So it's up to us to do that. I grew up in a household where the word love was not mentioned too much. 
Definitely no one ever said, I'm proud of you. Here's how my like, childhood went. When I'd fight with my sister, because I got an older sister, and wouldn't we go, and go at each other, it'd be the yelling from across the house from the parent, Chris, stop fighting with your sister. One day, you'll have to beg her for a job. Be nice to her. And it's like, thanks, Mom and Dad, for the vote of confidence that I'd turn out okay. I mean, come on. That's the opposite of I'm proud of you, right? It's crazy. Like, I had a messed up childhood. There was abuse. There's neglect, all kinds of craziness. We'll get into another time with my therapist. Not here, okay? But I remember standing in my front yard with my dad and, you know, we've kind of reworked our relationship over the year, and we're in, a, we're in an okay, good place, kind of. Could be better, but it's not bad. And I remember we were talking about the childhood and all the random bad things that happened in the yard. We're doing a project, and he said, Chris, how did you turn out so normal? And my answer to him was, Jesus. I found Jesus, and he changed everything for me. But between you and me, could you imagine if it was Jesus and a parent that would say, I'm proud of you? and I love you. I made all the bad decisions. Earlier I said, you, as a kid, when you grow up, you start making the bad decisions on your end. It's on you. It's not on your parents at some point. It's on me. But could you imagine some of the pain, some of the hurt, some of the bad decisions that I've made in my life? Maybe I would have not made some of those decisions. Maybe I could have avoided some pain if I would have had a mom and dad that would just have said, I'm so proud of you. And so, If you have not said that to your kids, figure it out. It's not rocket science. Spy on your kid's life and look for ways to say, I love you. I am so proud of you, and you should be proud of yourself also. The problem still goes on today. When your kids, okay, parents with adult children, don't you dare stop saying, I love you, and I'm proud of you. They need your encouragement, okay? They need it. I was a pastor in California for 10 years, well, maybe like 13 years, before moving here. My father, at any moment, lived in the same county, could have came to my church, not once. My father, at any moment, could have came and heard a sermon, not once did he listen. I don't even have to worry that he's listening, because he isn't. And I'm not trying to say he's a bad guy, he's just in his own little world. Parents of adult children, don't you make the same mistakes. Don't you do it. And for me, I'm not trying to say woe is me. It's a teaching moment. So if you had a childhood and you feel it was jacked up where you were raised, that it wasn't loving, that your parents blew it, your parents missed big opportunities, your parents are still missing big opportunities, but you're a mama and a daddy now, now's the time. Because for me and my house, we ain't going down that way, okay? When my kids come in the door, they hear it. I kiss them, I hug them, I tell them I'm proud of them. I look for any way to tell them I love them and I'm proud of them. I want my household to ooze love and confidence. I want this to be the safe zone. When they come into my house, this is where they get to recharge their emotional batteries. When they've held it together all day at school, they could come into my house and just fall apart. And I'm okay, and I'm going to protect that environment. And so I don't care if everybody else on the block thinks we're weird and different. And I just like, hey, I've got to create that kind of environment for my kids because I never had it in the chain of lack of love and confidence. That broken chain stops here with this generation. It will not continue in my family bloodline from this generation forward. And so start encouraging your children. Start encouraging your children. Hebrews 10 says this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another, of outbursts, of love and good works. That's what I want in my house. Outbursts of love and good works. We're naturally good at outbursts, just not of love. (laughs) Okay, the next letter, which is our last letter, and we're going to close out here, is L. L, which stands for learn from difficulty. Again, your kids are watching you. The way that you live, the way that you're doing, what you're doing in your life, they're watching you. And they're watching you in good times, and they're watching you in the bad times. How do you handle conflict? How do you handle crisis? How do you handle brokenness? How do you handle a storm? How do you handle your body failing you? How do you handle loss in the family? 
How do you handle bad things like losing your job? How are you handling this as being recorded in your kid's mind? They are watching you at all times. Okay, and so here's what we're going to learn. How I handle it one day, more often than not, will be something that they might replicate. And so we need to be aware, just like I said earlier, they're going to watch you live with honor and integrity. They're watching you live with honor and integrity or not with honor and integrity when difficult times hit your life. They're looking, does mom and dad hit the bottle as a coping mechanism to relieve the pain? Is mom and dad doing something like running out with another guy or another girl to release the pain? Is mom and dad running away from God when trouble hits? Or is mom and dad running to Jesus when trouble hits? Like, am I going to cling to Jesus as he's the only hope to get me through this? Or am I running the opposite direction? Your kids are watching. Subconsciously, it's getting written on them. Okay? And so we've got to learn, like, when we have difficulty, we model it, and then we use it as teachable moments, and we share, hey, mom and daddy are going through a hard time, but here's what I know. Jesus loves our family. He has not left our family. He's going to get our family through this. We still have each other, and we're going to be okay. And we have our church community that is is our safety net in life, and they're going to be here to provide and protect and to be here with us. Okay? And so I want my children to learn that when I go through difficulty, I run to Jesus. I run to my church community. You guys are my safety net. You guys are my safe place for my family. We're going to run to you when crisis happens and Jesus because it takes together to experience Jesus. We got Jesus one-on-one, and you got Jesus to be experienced through the context of community and fellowship. And so, allow your kids to learn from the difficulty that you can go through, so that way they know how to handle difficulty, brokenness, hurt, and pain. James chapter 1 says this, don't run from the tests and hardships, brothers and sisters, as difficult as they are, You will ultimately find joy in them if you embrace them. Your faith will blossom under the pressure and teach you the patience as you endure. So that's that's my encouragement for you. And maybe you're in that place. Maybe you feel like you're in a broken spot. Maybe you're a parent or not. You just feel like, man, I don't know how to handle the brokenness of life. Two words of encouragement. If you're a Christ follower... Don't quit and don't give up. Don't quit, don't give up. If you're not a Christ follower, my prayer for you is that you say yes to Jesus. You start leaning into that faith and watch him get you through this crisis. Help you get through the pain. To not allow this pain to break you. You see, the last thing what I want to teach when it comes to learning from difficulty, I want to model it so well that my kids don't ask why anymore. Like, why are we experiencing this? Why would God let this happen if he was real? That's not the question I want. I want my kids to start asking what. What can we learn from this? What is God teaching us through this moment? See, I know that if I release my brokenness to the Holy Spirit and to Jesus, I might always be flawed in that way. I might always have a struggle in that way. That pain might always need to be nurtured by the Holy Spirit day in and day out. But here's what I know. God can use brokenness that was meant to hurt me, meant to destroy me, and he could turn it around and be a light in someone else's life. He's done that through divorce in my life. He's done that through addiction in my life. He's done that through codependency in my life. And the list goes on. He's used those as opportunities for me to relate to other people. And so that's where my promise is to my kids. Hey, I don't know why this is all happening, but the real question we need to ask is what is God showing us? What is God teaching us in this moment? Because pain does not only have to hurt. If we listen close enough to God, he will teach us stuff through that pain. And then he'll redeem that pain to reach other people. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to speak about parenting. And even as myself, I'm humbled by the, the lesson this week. And I take it and I pray that we don't just brush it off as some good ideas but we're able to live it out. We're able to love our children because our family matters. And it's not just our family that matters, it's also our marriage matters. Help us to balance the workload, the tasks, the complications, the struggle, the anxiety, all of it. The worrying, if I'm messing my kid up, 
first, God, we're going to do our best for our ability, but we're giving our children to you, Lord. And we're asking that you guide us in our daily walk to be the best mom, the best dad, the best grandma, the best grandpa, the best extended family member, the best godparent or god sister, god brother, best extended friendship that we could be to these kids. Ultimately, Lord, we know you love our children, but you don't only love our children, you love us. You look at us as your children. And there's someone out here today that hasn't said yes to Jesus, and I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. You want to be a child of God. You want to go on this walk. You don't know what it's going to look like, but you're ready. You're ready to step out in faith and take it one day at a time and see what Jesus does. You're ready to accept Jesus as your Lord and God. I got some truth for you. The good news is Jesus loves you just the way that you are. He doesn't want you to have to figure your life out and then come back to him. He loves you with all the brokenness that we have. Skid knees and emotions and all. He wants to walk through this season with you. And so that's where we're at. Are you ready to give it to Jesus? To say yes to him? To accept him as Lord and Savior? To accept that grace, that undeserved forgiveness? We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us anyways that's you, all you got to do in your heart and in your mind is say, yes, Jesus. God's listening. Scriptures are quite clear. The Holy Spirit is praying on our behalf and he's reading our hearts and our minds because he loves you that much. God's always been there with you. And if you want to say yes to Jesus today, would you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, I say yes. I say yes to you being Lord of my life. I say yes to this grace, this undeserved forgiveness. Forgive me of wrongs that I've done. I say yes to not knowing what the future holds, but walking it out with you. I say yes to you putting me into a community where other people can help me, not just find you, but follow you. Thank you for your love, Jesus, and what you did on that cross. In Jesus' name, amen.